we are picking up Act 3, Scene 1, lines, mm, I'm going to back up just a little bit. <clears throat> um, line 29, we saw at the end, or we saw in Act 2, can't remember which scene, where Polonius says to Gertrude and Claudius that he will loose his daughter on Hamlet and he and Claudius will spy on their conversation and will be able to determine whether or not Hamlet is mad for love, as Polonius puts it. <clears throat> so, Act 3, uh, beginning line 30, 29, excuse me, the king tells um, Gertrude, leave, we have closely sent for Hamlet hither that he is torn by accident, may affront, may here affront Ophelia, okay? Um, and notice your gloss says for affront, confront. Now, what kind of meaning does confront usually have? If you confront somebody, what does that imply? Is that like going out for coffee, going out for beer? No. There's, there's antagonism there. There's opposition there. There's conflict there, okay? <clears throat> Her father and myself lawful espials. Lawful spies. I almost wrote S-P-Y-S. Mine's a wonderful thing to waste. Lawful spiles will so bestow ourselves that seeing unseen, we may of their encounter frankly judge. Okay? So we're going to position ourselves so that although we won't be seen, and that means seen by others on the stage as well as obviously the audience, we will still, he says, be able to do what? We'll overhear the conversation and we will judge what we see, okay? I'm getting to a point here. And he says, we may have their encounter frankly judge and gather by him as he has behaved, if it be the affliction of his love or no, that thus he suffers for. Queen says, I'll obey you. And then she kind of prays almost to Ophelia. She says, and for your part, Ophelia, I do wish that your good beauties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. I really hope it's because of your beauty that Hamlet is crazy. Why? So shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wanted way again to both your honors. Now, it's interesting because she refers in that little speech to Ophelia's beauties and honors. Excuse me. Beauties and virtues. Two of the exact same things Hamlet is going to talk to Ophelia about. Okay? And what does she mean when she says that she hopes that Ophelia's virtues will bring Hamlet to his wanted way again to both of their honors, to both of your honors. That is, that will bring honor to you both. Will the honor to Ophelia just be, oh, well, good, Ophelia, he loves you, and isn't that great for you? It is an honor for her to be loved by Hamlet. No. I think she's suggesting you will receive honor from our knowing that Hamlet loves you. And I think she's implying maybe you will marry Hamlet. Remember, everything... Her brother, Ophelia's brother, and father said, and, and Polonius said it just recently, Hamlet is out of her star. He is out of her league because he's a prince. Gertrude possibly is suggesting maybe not. Maybe you two can marry, okay? Madam, I wish it may. And I think she's picking up on what 
Gertrude might be in play. Okay? So, Polonius says, Ophelia will walk you here. Gracious, he's talking to the king, so please, you that is, hide. Because bear in mind, what are they going to do? Here's the stage. The back of the stage is like this. You've got two doors, okay? Those doors are often covered like this by curtains. Curtains that go floor to ceiling, all right? Um, sometimes at the Shakespeare's Globe in London now, there will be essentially a long curtain or a series of curtains going all the way across that back building, covering it, okay? So he says, we will bestow ourselves, we're gonna hide. He tells Ophelia, read this book, that show of such an exercise may color your loneliness, okay? Your gloss tells you exercise, act of devotion. The book she reads is one of devotion. It's probably a prayer book. So then when she reads, she might literally be moving her lips. Not reading aloud, but moving her lips. Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me. That kind of thing. It, I think it's important that we understand that because when Hamlet sees her, he's going to say, but fair, uh, but soft, the fair Ophelia, nymph, remember me in your orisons. Orisons is Latin for prayer, okay? And then Polonius says, we are oft to blame in this, tis too much proved, that is too often seen, that with devotion's visage and pious action, we do sugar or the devil himself. You know, think of what he just said. We do what? He means we humanity. With devotion's visage, that is a face that looks like it is full of love for God, in pious action, good deeds, going to church, you know, all that kind of stuff. We do what? We sugar over the devil himself. We make the devil seem sweet. We make the devil acceptable. We make the devil palatable. Okay? Now, notice when he says this. He says it in the context of Ophelia, take this book and do what? Be bait for Hamlet. Okay? With devotion's visions and pious action, he's handed her a prayer book, a book of devotion, your gloss says. How is she supposed to appear? Holy, devout, sinless, innocent, pure. Okay? See, reading prayers is a good work. It is a good deed. Why is she doing it, though? She's part of this plot. She knows she's part of the plot. She was in there when the king said, We've called for Hamlet so that he may affront Ophelia. She's not an unwitting, unwilling participant here. All right? So that with devotions, visits, and pious action, we do sugar over the devil himself. Wow. You, one way you could read that is he's suggesting something about Ophelia's part in this. What, what is the devil's quote-unquote main job, so to speak? Go back to the book of Genesis. Deceive. To deceive, to tempt, to trick. What is Ophelia's purpose in the scene? To deceive, to trick, to tempt. The king responds with an aside. Bear in mind, in an aside, the other characters on the stage do not hear this. The aside is for the audience alone. And the king says, oh, tis too true. Well, Polonius already said it's too true, right? Tis too much proved. 
His point there is, I do it, you do it, you do it, you. We all do this, okay? The king, tis too true. How smart a lash that speech doth give my conscience. He has a conscience. So what does he mean? What does he know he's done? Wrong. Why? Because he's covered over with pi with devotion's visage and pious action. What? Turn the next page. The harlot's cheek, beauty with plastering art, that is, makeup, is not more ugly to the thing that helps it than is my deed to my most painted word. His painted word. He's put on an act. Okay? And that act is what? He's holy, he's devout, he's lawfully married his wife, his <coughs> dead brother's sister. Okay? He's suffering from his conscience because he knows what he's done is not just wrong or bad, it's evil. <laughs> oh, heavy burden. He's weighed down with this inner knowledge of his wrongs. Just one second. Since only you guys have shown up. If you would, find this second page. <clears throat> so, Polonius, I hear him coming. Let's withdraw, my lord. In the next passage, long speech, your textbook calls you, uh, tells you, um, my edition of Shakespeare that I use for my Shakespeare course says this, and the guy who edited it is one of the top Shakespeare scholars in the world, that this speech by Hamlet is the greatest soliloquy in the English language. What's the problem with that statement? It's not a soliloquy. Why not? Who hasn't left the stage before Hamlet enters? Ophelia. Hamlet comes out through one of these doors and Ophelia is still out there. Okay? The king and Polonius quote unquote leave but do they fully leave? That is do they go back here? We don't literally know because once they're outside of our vision off the stage, they can metaphorically be anywhere. But we're going to find out after the scene between Hamlet and Ophelia, they hear everything on the stage. Okay? The only way within the fiction of a theater, the only way that can happen is if they are somewhere present within those boundaries. Okay? What does that mean? They're standing behind the heiress. They're hidden, they're covered, but they are still on the stage. Now, it says exit. That usually means all the way off the stage, which is why most people think it means they're really fully gone. They can't have exited if they hear what's there. Okay? So, Hamlet comes out, greatest soliloquy in the English language. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing in them. To die, to sleep, no more. 
and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. Let's pause there for a minute. So, to exist or not to exist? That's the question. What does he mean? To go on living or to kill myself? Now, the reason this is considered by so many to be a soliloquy is because it echoes back to Hamlet's first soliloquy. Oh, that this too too sullied flesh would thaw, melt, and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed this canon against self-slaughter. Self-slaughter, suicide. Okay? Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Hamlet, where have we heard fortune referred to? Recently, Hamlet talking with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, okay, where they joke about where they are in fortune's body, you know, fake her private suite, right? The slings and out arrows of outrageous fortune. That merely means all that crap that life throws at us, okay, on a daily basis. So is it nobler in the mind to endure all that or to take arms against a sea of troubles, the storms of life, and by opposing in them? Arms, knife, you know, a lot of ways you can kill yourself. Pistol, rope, to die, to sleep. Why does he have to sleep after to die? Because in the Renaissance, sleep, and it still is today, sleep is a metaphor for death. What do you, you know, metaphorically see on a tombstone? Requiescat in pacem, rest in peace. What does rest mean? And then you wake up. It doesn't say die in peace or dead in peace. To die, to sleep. <sighs> no more. No more what? No more anything. No more problems. And by a sleep to say we end, notice the first thing he mentioned, the heartache. And the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. So, two things there, heartache and the natural shocks that flesh, the body, is heir to, that is, that the body inherits. You guys are all young. I'm 62. I used to run marathons. I can't run 10 feet now because of knee replacement in this knee, knee replacement coming up this August in this knee. Those are the shocks he's talking about. All the problems of the body, the aches and pains that develop into worse things over time. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. What's a consummation? To have all that end. And when he says a consummation, that is an intentional echo of Christ's last words on the cross. Consumatum est. It is not finished. Consumatum and consummation doesn't mean finished. It means perfected. It is perfected, Christ says. Meaning, everything I've come for, nailed it. <laughs> Pun included. Nailed it perfectly. You know, as we come up to Good Friday in a week. Western Good Friday. So he goes on. Consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep. Well, what happens when you sleep? If you enter REM stage of sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. 
For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, the body, must give us pause. In that conversation he had with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, remember Rosencrantz tells Hamlet, the reason you think Denmark is a prison is because it's too small for your ambition. And Hamlet says, oh God, I could be a king of infinite space, bounded in a nutshell, were it not for bad dreams. And he brings up dreams here. Why? Where do the dreams come from? In that sleep of death, what dreams may come? That is, when we are sleeping in death, what dreams may come to us? Must give us pause. What's he mean? This is the doorway to death. Unlike this door, Death doesn't have a window, does it? We can't peek inside and come back. Once you go through, you're through, right? Even you know, recent so-called near-death experiences, notice those are near death. We have very, very, very little quote-unquote anecdotal evidence of someone who's been dead for, say, an hour or two hours coming back. Brain usually is by that time. So what does he mean about this death that must give us pause? There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. What does he mean by respect? You've got a gloss down there. Consideration. That is, that is something that you take into consideration when thinking to be or not to be. Why? It makes a long life calamitous. Because you endure a lot in that long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the breakdown of the body and such, the oppressor's long, and then he's going to start naming titles, jobs, offices. Okay? Oppressors, the proud man's contumely, that is, his looking down his nose at you, the pangs of despised love. Whose love has been despised so far in this play? Hamlet's. Because Ophelia has closed her door to him. She will no longer talk with him. The laws delay. Why? Justice delayed is justice denied. That's why our Constitution, Sixth Amendment, I think, guarantees a speedy trial. And yet there are people literally around the country who are in jail, who have been in jail for over a year, and they haven't been charged. They haven't been tried. Some of them haven't been charged. Others have been charged but not tried yet. Uh, the laws delay, the insolence of office, that's again, people with a high sounding political position looking down their nose at everybody else, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. When, when the person who suffers any of these or all of these, he says, might his quietest make with a bare bodkin, a dagger, his quietus, his end. Who would fartles, that's another word for burdens, or burdens, who would fartles bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life? Who would suffer all the crap that life gives, but except unless that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we know than fly to others that we know not of. The old phrase, 
Better the devil you know than the one you don't know. Meaning, better the problems and slings and arrows of this life than God's will. Because we're all going to end up here eventually. If we rush it, the what's on the other side of the door might be different than if we suffer here. <clears throat> and notice because of thinking about what might come after death that puzzles the will the will the volitional aspect of the human being the part that says go do this or don't do that okay the conscience is involved but the will is the acting out of it what does it mean to puzzle the will? Should I? Shouldn't I? I, I? I don't know. So you don't act at all. And it makes us bear those ills we have to endure them rather than fly to others we don't know about. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. Hamlet is saying, if we didn't have a conscience, we would be, quote unquote, man enough to off ourselves and be done with the crap of this world. Okay? And thus the native hue of resolution is sickly over with a pale cast of thought. What's the native hue of resolution? Hue is the color of your face. It's metaphorical. But in some sense, some sense it's also not metaphorical. If you've ever have, had to lift or move a very heavy weight, I've had, I, I used this analogy in my class yesterday and nobody had ever had to do this. If you've ever had a car breakdown, and you're the only one in it, sometimes you have to push that car so that it's out of traffic. Okay? I've literally had a car, you know, at a red light, just die. Just, and I had to, by myself, open the door, one hand on the steering wheel, the other hand on the door jam, push that car so that it was out of the line of traffic, okay? What happens to your face when you do something like that? Much more clearly evident when you're white. You turn beet red because all that blood goes to your face. What happens when you're just livid, angry, like you want to kill someone, for something they've said. Well, that native hue of resolution, your face turns red, okay? What does he say happens to that because of conscience? It is sicklied over with the pale cast of thought. Thinking, he's saying, does what? Makes you lose that resolve to do something. In enterprises of great pitch and moment, pitch, height. Like the pitch of an angle, okay? With this regard, that is, with thoughts for consequences. That's what he's talking about. What are, gonna, what are the consequences of this act going to be? What are the consequences, obviously, of committing suicide? You're dead, you're on the other side, and you don't know what you're facing. Turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now. The fair Ophelia. Now, the text has soft you now, exclamation mark. Why? Because the exclamation mark means he exclaims it. He says it loudly. To attract Ophelia's attention? Nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. In your prayers, remember my sins. Now, that can be re read two different ways. Pray for forgiveness of my sins, or, and God, remember, Hamlet has done. It's probably the former that is intended, but the latter is also a possibility. Question. 
Did Hamlet just now realize that Ophelia is on the stage? Or that Ophelia was there? Or does Hamlet say this to draw the audience's attention to the fact that he is aware she's out there? My reading, I could be wrong. Well, yeah, I could be wrong. But that's, I could only be wrong if there is a certain, sure, right way of reading these lines. And I don't know that there is. Okay? My reading is that when Hamlet comes out, he sees Ophelia. And that's just because I don't think this is a soliloquy. Because he's not the only one on stage. And when he sees Ophelia, he knows the jig is up. Okay? How do we know, or on what evidence do I think that Hamlet knows something about Ophelia? Where was the last time we saw Hamlet and Ophelia together? Remember when Ophelia comes into her father's room? After his father, her father sends Reynaldo away, and she's apparently all upset, and he asks what's wrong, and she says, Hamlet came into my room, his doublet ungartered, his doublet undone, his stockings ungartered, no hat on his head, he grabs her hand and does the sign and stuff, and then leaves. Why did Hamlet do that? Was that Hamlet's true inner condition? Or is that part of the antic disposition he might put on? She says, good, my lord, how does your honor for this many a day? She hasn't talked to him for a while. I humbly thank thee, well, well, well. I, I have remembrances of yours. And she tries to give him a packet of papers. I, not me, I never gave you honor. I never gave you anything. My, my honored Lord, you know right well you did. Okay, how do we know he did? How do we know Hamlet is lying here? Because they have the papers in Hamlet's handwriting. Polonius read from one of those poems to the king and queen as evidence that Hamlet, crazy for love. Uh, you know you did. And with the whole oh man. Words of so sweet breath composed has made the things more rich. In other words, I read those words and I was like, oh, the most wonderful aroma in the world. Their perfume lost, that is, now they're stale. They're like rose petals that have lost their youth. Take them back. Now, what does she mean, the perfume lost? can mean, again, a couple of different things. One, they no longer smell pretty to me. Why? Because she no longer loves Hamlet? Possible. Two, she no longer thinks Hamlet was sincere in his love expression in giving them to her. Well, that's what both her father and brother told her. That these were just Brokers, pawns. These were like money <laughs> to get one thing from her, sex. Remember, because Polonius used the word bonds. They were like pimps. Rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. She's suggesting it's the latter one. You weren't sincere. When she had not been told what Hamlet meant or intended by her brother and father, she thought, oh, this is so beautiful. Once she spoke to her brother and father, she now thinks, you dirty, rotten bastard. All you want to do is get my pants. Hamlet, <laughs> are you honest? Well, my lord, are you fair? And you've got a gloss for honest, meaning truthful and chaste. Sexually pure, okay? And fair meaning just and honorable. 
So he asks, are you honest? And she's like, what? Are you fair? What do you mean? Notice how he goes from one topic to something totally different. Same thing he did in talking with Polonius. And when he was talking with Polonius earlier, he was also being spied on then. All right? What do you mean? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. So look at your glosses. That if you are honest and fair, that is, if you are truthful, chaste, and just, and honorable, then your honesty, chastity, chastity comes from being chaste, honesty comes from being honest, then your chastity, lost my place, should admit no discourse, familiar intercourse with, what? Your beauty. Okay. And she's like, hold on, I'm trying to figure this out. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce, intercourse, not sexual intercourse, just interchange. Could beauty have better interchange, let's say, than with honesty? Shouldn't beauty, and she's talking about physical beauty here, go along with chastity? If we take chastity to be the meaning of honesty. Hamlet, yes it should. For the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty, chastity, from what it is, chastity, to a bod. What is a bod? Not a term we use. Pimp. That's what it means. Or madam, if you want. A seller of flesh. A procure, procurer of sex. So, back up for a second. The power of beauty will sooner transform. It will change honesty from being what it is, that is chastity, to a bod. Something to secure sex. Then the force of honesty, that is chastity, can translate beauty into his likeness. Chastity can't make beauty chaste. He's saying beauty exists for one reason. To get into bed. This was sometimes a paradox. But now time gives it proof. The time. The present age. Well, what's the present age for Hamlet? My mother used to be honest. Chaste. How so? She was only involved sexually with one man, her husband. Having as much sex as you want with your spouse is still being chased. It's when you go outside the marriage, it's blown, all right? The present age, mom ain't so chaste anymore. Sleeping with her dead husband's brother, even though it's marriage. So she asks that question, Hamlet responds, and it says, indeed, I did love you once. Oh, it made me cry so much. The perfume of those letters, oh man. She's saying, Hamlet, I took the bait hook, line, and sinker. You should not have believed me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. You've got a long gloss down at the bottom. Inoculate. Graft. Okay. Our old stock. Think of a tree. Okay. Tree grows, has branches. You can cut that tree trunk off there. And you can bring a branch from another kind of tree and put it there Wrap this around with tape, and this tree stock, let's say this is plum, okay? And this is pear, the one that you graft on. You'll now have a different kind of tree. I've got a tree at home, it's called a fruit cocktail tree. It produces fruit, apricots, peaches, and plums. Because it has three different graftings, okay? What's he talking about, though? 
cannot so inoculate our old stock. That's the trunk. What's he mean by old stock? Sinful flesh. Why? Because of the Christian doctrine. Let me rephrase that. The Western Christian doctrine of original sin. It's the old Adam that St. Paul talks about throughout his letters. Juxtaposed with the new Adam, Christ. All right? So he says, virtue cannot so inoculate, graft onto our old stock, but we shall relish of it. That is, you cannot be so virtuous that you totally replace this or this, right? So now we have to take a minute. Let me get a different marker. Whoops, better. To talk about this idea more, which means we're going to get a bit bogged down. A. where we really start to get into the, the Christian theological divisions, so to speak, of Shakespeare's day within the play. Right? So, at Shakespeare's time, you've got the Catholic Church in England declining because Catholicism has been outlawed. Banned. To be a Catholic priest in London in the 1590s, or in anywhere in England, was a capital offense. That is, just by being there, if you were caught, you could be executed. Burned at the stake or hung, all right? So you have this war, so to speak, between Catholicism and Protestantism. Bit of a history lesson. 1517, 1031, 1517, October 31st. Martin Luther okay, nails on the church door in Wittenberg, um, Germany, the same Wittenberg that Hamlet is a student at, right? It's going to come up later. Luther nails 95 theses to the church door. Theses. It's the plural for thesis, okay? An argument, 95 of them. These are 95 problems he sees in the church he wants cleaned. He wants to be cleansed. He's a monk. He's an Augustinian monk. That's the brand of monk, so to speak, that he belongs to. All right? Nobody takes him up on it. No cardinals, no bishop, archbishops agree to debate him. So he starts writing his ideas. And because the printing press had been invented about 60 years earlier, these ideas get printed and spread throughout Germany. That is the beginning of the Protestant, Refor Protestant Reformation. All right? Protestant Reformation, through Luther and John Calvin and others, had three mottos. Sola fides, sola scriptura, sola gratia. Faith alone, oh, sola means alone, by itself. Scripture alone, grace alone. These countered everything that was thought that the Catholic Church taught. Because the Catholic Church taught it wasn't faith alone that merited salvation. It was also good works. It wasn't scripture alone that one needed in order to understand God's will because you had the church was important in terms of how to interpret scripture, etc. Having priests and that. It wasn't grace alone. Okay? Again, we also 
had to work towards our salvation. All right? Go from this to this. So this is general Protestant Reformation kind of belief. This is Calvinism in a nutshell, okay? I used to be diehard Calvinist. Not in on I'm Orthodox, like Greek Orthodox. So Calvin's belief system could be very, very simplified with the word tulip, right? T, total, and this is why I'm including all this. This is going to be the original sin. Total depravity. Every one of us is touched by sin, tainted. Nothing we do is free of sin. Even the greatest, quote unquote, good deed, helping some little old lady across the street because you don't want her to get hit by cars, right? It's touched by some sense of ego or selfishness, like, ooh, it makes me feel good. I did a good deed. See, that's ego, that's pride, bad. We just made it not a good deed, all right? You, unconditional election, okay? God chooses who gets saved and that's it. And according to the Calvinist mentality, if you guys were all of humanity, you're saved, you're saved, and you're saved. The rest go to hell. The vast majority of humanity, according to Calvin, strict Calvinist thought, is in hell. They're in hell from the day they're born. All right? L. Limited atonement. Christ didn't die for everybody. The whole purpose of the cross was not for everybody. It was for you, you, and you, and not for anybody else. All right? I, irresistible grace. Because the atonement was limited, God showers his grace like rain showers on certain people. Those people, I said, you, you, and you, you cannot resist it. No matter what you do, you can't deny God. Okay? Last one. Perseverance of the saints. The saints are those who have received grace and been elected. And that means they're going to stick it out until the end. They will never deny God. They will never turn against God or Christ, if you want. All right? You know, pick an example of somebody who, you know, our kind of American consciousness thinks of as a quote unquote holy person. Pope John Paul II. Even Protestants liked him. Okay? Billy Graham. If Billy Graham on his deathbed had said, it's all an effing lie, God's a, it's just, you know, string of expletives. That would indicate to a Calvinist, oh, he wasn't really elected. He didn't receive irresistible grace because he didn't persevere to the very end. Okay? This is all important, primarily because all of this flows from this, all right? This total depravity idea comes from St. Augustine, 5th century North African bishop, Bishop of Hippo. St. Augustine taught, and this becomes the dominant ideology of, the, of all Western Christendom. Western meaning Europe, primarily, and places influenced by Europe. Augustine taught that this idea was passed on, or this fact, was passed on genetically. That is, it's passed on through sex. So every time a child is born as a result of sex, that child inherits this original sin. That child is guilty from the moment of birth. Okay? Which is why the Catholic Church, more so in the Middle Ages than it does today, emphasize the need to baptize children 
pretty quickly. Because if you don't, you'll go to hell. Not hell, fire, and brimstone. Limbo. It's an area outside hell, but it's not a place of paradise or blessing or such. All right? Um, it was only recently, Benedict, Pope Benedict, I think it was, did away with the Catholic doctrine of hell. Uh, excuse me, limbo. Said, there is no limbo. And essentially said, if a baby dies unbaptized, that child goes to heaven. There is no limbo for that child, right? So this gets passed on. This is this. This is what makes the old stuck. That's why Christianity says there must be a transformation. There must be a renewal and such. The whole rite of baptism is dying and then what? being reborn, being resurrected like Christ was resurrected. So, when Hamlet says virtue cannot do what? Inoculate this old stock. He's saying by virtue, good works, good deeds can't erase it. The Catholic Church said when you do good deeds, that builds up in your quote-unquote good deeds slash salvation account. In fact, you can do such good deeds that you have more salvation than you need. That goes into the divine bank account of good deeds that can then be applied to others via the process of what are called indulgences. Okay? What are the things that set Martin Luther off on this? Was a man named Johann Tetzel, a seller of indulgences. Indulgences were pieces of paper issued by the Pope, by the Catholic Church, that said, you buy one of these and you can get time out of purgatory. For either yourself or somebody else, a loved one. And you can pay different money amounts for different indulgences. The problem that Luther saw is people were buying indulgences for sins they hadn't yet committed. So let's say, being a red-blooded, heterosexual male, I see a beautiful woman, I say, man, I'd really like to have sex with her. I think I'm going to rape her. You could literally buy an indulgence that would say, this is my get-out-of-jail card. Luther would buy it. That's repugnant. That is a repulsive idea. That cannot have anything to do with Christianity. Right? He was also offended because the money that went to those indulgences went to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and didn't stay in Germany. He kind of wanted to make Germany great again. Maga, real Maga. Right? <clears throat> right? So, this is what Hamlet's getting at here. You can do all the virtuous acts in the world, he says, but it won't so inoculate our old stock, but what? There will be that part of me that says, this sin, mine. Where have we seen that? Earlier this semester. The minister's black widow. Hawthorne came from a family of Calvin. Hawthorne's ancestors, I'm directly related to Hawthorne. Hawthorne's ancestors burned witches. And he had this mental generational guilt over that. Okay? So, Hamlet finishes that with, I loved you not. He's now said twice, I loved you not. I was the more deceived. Why was she the more deceived? Get thee to a nunnery. Why? Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? The old stock, if she has children, those children will be sinners. He says, me? I'm indifferent, honest. But I could accuse myself of 
and he lists sins. And he says, what should such fellows as I do crawling beneath earth, sorry, earth and heaven? What do you do? What are you if you crawl beneath the earth? What crawls beneath the earth? Worms. What crawls beneath heaven? Us. We are errant knaves all. Errant knaves. We are sinful wanderers. That's what errant means. Last thing before I let you go. Believe none of us. Get you to a nunnery. And then he asks a question. Where's your father? Why? Why does he ask that question? Why does he say, believe none of us? See, I think those two statements, that statement, believe none of us, and where's your father, is giving us an indication of what is going on in Hamlet's mind. I think he knows exactly where her father is. Where is her father? Right now. He's spying, right? Where's your father? At home, my lord. What has Ophelia just done? For the first time, directly to Hamlet. She knows her father is not at home. She knows her father is watching this whole thing. What does Hamlet say? Let the doors be shut on him, that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. Why? Polonius, if you're listening, you come lesson with me, you're going to suffer. Okay, we'll stop there. We're going to put... We're going to come back to this scene with Hamlet and Ophelia um, briefly on whatever that day is, Friday. We'll finish Act 3. We should finish Act 3 on Friday. <clears throat> Sorry for going a couple minutes over.